Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Malkaberger, um, and I'm the president of the Student Hall of Education Movement here at the University. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and I also want to thank the East End Executive Board for their efforts that made this event possible. And of course, I want to thank um, Ron Jones and his wife for coming out tonight. Two and a half years ago, on the premise that our generation will be the last to physically hear from Holocaust survivors. It's our mission to continue to be their voice even when they're no longer with us. We must carry the torch of Holocaust education and memory for the generations to come. We strive to communicate and reinforce the lessons of the Holocaust because we want to engage students in intellectual and relevant discussion. We want to encourage students to think critically about the Holocaust and its significance. How apropos is it that tonight, one week from the 73rd anniversary of Kristallnacht, we're gathered here to learn and reinforce the lessons of that night and the tragedy that continued from then? Most people want to be part of something larger than themselves. They want to be part of a group. Doesn't necessarily matter what group, but the feeling of being a part of something draws people in. It's a part of human nature that hasn't changed since 1967, when the third wave proved how important being a part of a larger group actually is to an individual. Ordinary people, students who were probably inclined towards good, were overtaken by a group dynamic and the goals of the group, leading them to make bad or even careless decisions. But we must remind ourselves and others that we have the responsibility to always be upstanders, to think about our own moral conscience and make the right decisions. It seems as though the cost of standing up and standing out within a group is too high, and this is why people choose to follow and not to lead. But in truth, the costs of not speaking out are much, much higher. Especially today when hatred and anti-Semitism are rampant. Especially today, a week after commemorating Kasama. We must remember that we are the last generation who will hear from Holocaust survivors. We have the responsibility to be leaders and remind the world that we are in no way immune to what happened in World War II or in Mr. Jones' classroom. Tonight we'll be hearing from Ron Jones, an American writer and storyteller who started the infamous third grade in his high school history classroom. This was an inspiration for the famous book by Todd Strasser and the 1981 film. In 2010, one of Mr. Jones' students, Philip Carneal, produced the documentary Lesson Plan, a compilation of interviews from students and faculty who experienced the third grade. They reflect on what happened in their classroom in 1967 and lessons of conformity, the nature of humans, and fascism are seen. It became clear that even democratic societies are not going to need to be dealt fascism as a movement to find a life of its own. Following the screening of the film, we'll hear from Mr. Jones, and after his address, we're going to open the floor for questions. Thank you again very much for coming, and we hope that our program reinforces the lessons of conformity and responsibility so that we can truly embody the words, never again. Now that we've had a chance to learn more about the third wave and the reactions of the students, faculty, and parents that were involved in this groundbreaking examination of human nature, I'm excited to move on to the second half of this evening's program. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ron Jones, the teacher who conducted the third wave experiment in 1967. Mr. Jones, an American writer and educator in San Francisco, California, and as a common storyteller, Mr. Jones will treat us with a selection of stories that will illuminate the messages that we can draw from the third wave. After this, Mr. Mr. Jones will participate in a question and answer session. We will have an opportunity to ask him about his experience. Without further ado, Mr. Ron Jones. Uh, thank you. It, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be here. I had planned to tell some short stories, but I really changed my mind. I'm going to tell you a, a story I've only told once before to a public audience. Following the wave, I received uh, hundreds of telephone calls asking about it, how it could be repeated. 
And I refused to answer the phone. Then I got a call one very late evening. It's the call you don't want to get. You know, when it's two or three in the morning and the phone rings. And I heard this voice at the other end. Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones. My name is Eva, Eva Moses. You will come to Terre Haute, Indiana, Mr. Jones. We are the twins, the twins from Auschwitz. Please come. I have sold everything for this. It is a conference for the children of Terre Haute, Indiana. You will come. Yes? I got on a plane the next day. Terre Haute, Indiana. I was Eva Moses because she's standing there with this uh, real estate sign that says, Eva Moses welcomes you, Mr. Jones. <laughs> and she's a very short woman with these eyes that are like ball bearings, just shifting back and forth in her eyes. You know how you see someone and you have this comradeship almost immediately? I mean, she looked a little older than I expected. But then when you reach my age, everyone looks a little older than you expect. And she said, Mr. Jones, you look a little older than I expected. You look a little older than I expect. <laughs> she took me to her automobile. Terrible Indiana in the winter. She has a Cadillac convertible top down. <laughs> filled with real estate signs in the back. She drives rather erratically, like 80 miles an hour, and then suddenly the car slows, almost to a stop. And she looks over at this field, and the stream of consciousness just spills from her. Mr. Jones, sometimes I see there, I see hay. When I shop at the store, I see oranges all piled up and I see skulls. Always I see skulls. The children of Terre Haute, Indiana should not see this. They should know about the Holocaust. Everyone will be there. She was so excited. She put this into the Hilton, the biggest hotel in town. She had rented every room for her convention. The restaurant was designed as a convention center. She placed her hand on every table in the room and she explained. Her wrist kind of jingled with a bracelet. They will all be here. The twins. I have found 67 twins. They will be here. And Charles Corralt, 60 minutes. They will hear our story finally. I was really excited. Checking into the Hilton, the, the man behind the desk threw a strange question in towards me. You don't look Jewish. <laughs> no, no, I'm from San Francisco. But as I entered the elevator, she thinks she owns us. I went to bed that night with dreams of meeting the Holocaust survivors. I'm a history teacher. I'll be filling my mind full of these events and these wonderful people. It's can't, I cannot wait to meet her sister Miriam with the blue eyes and all the other survivors she's described to me. And I raced down into the hotel lobby that morning to meet this contingency of people and oh jeez there's only a handful five six at the most these are the survivors and where's the press not a single newspaper there are no television cameras she had sold her house for this conference Invited the twins and all the press. Oh, this is the Holocaust. These tables sitting there. 
and no one is in attendance. There are no grandfathers, there are no aunts, or there are no uncles, there's no family. This is the horror that we're left with. She keeps us going. I mean, she's got balloons now and she's racing back and forth to the airport to bring us people that never arrive. Finally, for the press conference, she says, we'll just talk. And we sit in this little podium, the four or five of us. This man is about six foot five with a pencil thin mustache and Miriam sitting next to him and then I'm here and then there's Eva and then there's another lady with a strange Marilyn Monroe wig. And we're looking out at a high school newspaper that comes to record the event. She stands up, Eva, and begins to talk. I want to tell you about the Holocaust. I want to tell you what happened to us with the survivors. And her eyes begin to move back and, and forth. And she comes to a stop. I go, oh. She, she can't finish. This is the final insult. When suddenly the man with the pencil thin mustache stands, We are here to tell you what happened. Joseph Mangala took us, children, twins, conducted these experiments on us, submerged us in freezing water, tried to make our eyes blue. My brother, they took off one arm, and then they took off the other arm and his legs and they pushed him. He could no longer even sit up. My brother that was always talking so much, he stopped talking. Miriam stood up, the sister with the blue eyes. It was on the trains, always the crying children. The crying children, I was so grateful when they stopped crying. When the mothers, they suffocated these children. But the noise, the noise had stopped. And when I got off the train, my mother gave me a toothbrush. A toothbrush. She went one way and I was asked to go the other. The woman with the blonde wig. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. I tell you, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And her wig was all over the place when Miriam finally grabbed her shoulders and settled her down. It did happen. We were the twins, children. Do you realize we were given special treatment? We were allowed to keep our hair, allowed to keep our clothing. And we could walk through Auschwitz. We could go any place we wanted. We were the twins. And Joseph Mangala, always dressed in white, with his medical experiments always placed out in front of us, those tools. He was our father. He gave us candy. Hmm. And when we had our children, our children, I cried because I had no mother to share this event with. Only the thought of what had taken place with me as a young woman the rumor that we were inseminated with cow and animal semen and those instruments and this Joseph Mengele always oh, dressed in white. The one press person simply left the room. Eva would not give up. She looked upon us sitting there and said, now, now is the gift, the greatest gift we will go to speak to the children of Terre Haute, Indiana, and we will tell our story. <sighs> okay, all right, good. She has printed books for every child in Terre Haute, Indiana. 220 pages for every child. And there will be this assembly, and they will be there. We walk into the high school auditorium, and there's no one there. 
not a single child. On the podium, someone has scratched a swastika. I take my coat off and make sure she not see this. The principal of the school arrives in the back of the auditorium. The doors go open. They see this light and feel this air. The principal shouts down at us, Eva, I'm sorry to tell you, Eva, we had to cancel this rally, this assembly. We have decided that this is too dangerous for the children to hear. This assembly is canceled. And the books have been destroyed. Eva is pissed. She races up the aisle and starts chasing this principal down the hall. You schmuck! You schmuck! You schmuck! Five minutes later, she arrives with the principal's shoes in her hand <laughs> and two children that she drags to the front of the auditorium and has them sit down in front of us and hear the story that's going to be placed in front of them. She tells her story. We tell our story. One of the children raises their hand at the end and says, as children are always prone to do, was there any good Germans? Oh, I anticipate a no. Eva says, yes, there was one. I'm going, I want to hear this. One night a train arrived and the doors opened as customary and the dogs were barking and the, the children, instead of spilling out of this cargo area, were strangely all in line. There were boys on one side and girls on the other and, and they were short to tall and really orderly. And then out of the train at the last moment appeared an older German wearing a German uniform from World War I, but all the Ilan of an SS officer, all that stuff. And his students refused to move. Joseph Mengele arrived, somewhat surprised to see this German officer with this Jewish children. He beckoned the Jewish children to move, and they did not move. He said, I want to see the twins. There were no twins to see. Finally, he asked the German officer, come here. Come here. The German officer said simply, I am the teacher of these children. I have been with them for two years. I will be with them here. You have Red Cross, don't you? You have schools for my children, don't you? Joseph Mengele pointed to this sky and it was ashen. And these ashes were falling like snow. He said, These are your children. And the German officer realized all the horrors he'd been thought and told about the rumors of fact that this was true, this was the Holocaust, this was the end. He stood in front of his children and marched towards the crematorium, and he led them in. So, Eva said, you cannot wait until they place the star upon your best dress. You cannot wait to stand up and struggle for your freedom and for your life. Eva Moses, Eva Moses, candles. Take a look at it. You will see her and find her sister Miriam and her story. Thank you. I think Rachel's going to go around and solicit questions. Right, if you have a question, please raise your hand. So 
I coach basketball if you have any basketball questions. I, I coach, you know, I have grandchildren if you have any grandchildren questions. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, so, among other things, I was wondering if when you started this experiment, did you get any idea where it would end up and if you had a plan of what to stop it? No, I had no idea. The first day was planned, but the subsequent days were very improvisational. And then 40 years later, it brings me here, so who knows what life can bring you. We often think that life is planned and can be expected. I don't think that's true. I think life can only be appreciated. Great question. I don't enjoy your actually going back and telling the story because there is a lot of guilt. And there's a lot of curiosity about why did I enjoy it so much, the power, the adulation, the control. That's kind of scares me actually. I like to focus my life on what I do now, which is do poetry and work in other ways. <laughs> this is not much fun to go back to, I'm sure for you as well. Would I advocate using this social experiment to work classrooms today? Absolutely not. Uh, way too dangerous. There's other things to do to learn about democracy and justice. <laughs> I, I would advocate that students work on that aspect. Yes, and it was broken. Um, I just wanted to know um, if any of the students were kind of traumatized by the experiment, and what was the transition back into you know, regular classroom schedule like? The question is, were any students traumatized and what happened afterwards? I think we were all traumatized, the teacher included. So we, we stepped into something, we walked across something, we tasted something that was ugly and uh, didn't feel good. But fortunately, we had ways of empowering ourselves individually, finding what makes someone personal and neat and different and unique, and we worked on that. And then the war in Vietnam was huge. Many of the students involved in this classroom became members of the United Student Movement were active in trying to stop the war. And that gave us a sense of cohesion and purpose. I was dismissed from the school two years after the actual event of the way, and actually there was a chorus of hundreds of students and parents that stood up for me, and there was not a negative or hostile voice in that whole community. And I was so grateful for that because it allowed me to have a life. It, 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 it was like everyone stood up and said, he's, he's okay. I had spent time with conservative parents and more radical parents, and they just, they just understood. So I was, I was graced by their insistence that this teacher stay. And that kind of gave me the power to go, basically. I was never allowed to teach again in a public high school. But I have found a lot of teaching in mental hospitals, and uh, I worked for 30 years teaching the physically and mentally disabled. And again, life can't be planned. That surprise in my life has been a blessing. I, mean, I, love, I love teaching those populations and empowering them. I did a lot of work in theater and sports. Yes, in the middle. Hi, so you, the experiments sort of showed that we're not all immune to this kind of like societal influence. But if we want to believe that like, the Holocaust and the Germans were innately evil, that it wasn't natural, we're not all evil. Like, 
I think we all have the potential for being very evil, yes, I do. Um, I'm often asked what I learned by the experiment, and I repeated this a few minutes ago to some students that were doing some newspaper work. I think I've learned about what is good, and, and good is trusting oneself and others, and evil is driven by fear, fear of yourself and others. But I know that I'm capable of either. If someone drives down the street and cuts me off and, and yells some epitaph at my children that are my grandchildren are biracial, I'm, my heart pounds and I, I, my fist curls and I know that I am capable of doing things that are not healthy. Does that help? Does that answer that? Or? Sombardo and I have met a couple times, and we actually sat and watched this film together. He made a fascinating comment. This is appropriate for the women in the room to hear. In both our situations, um, yeah, our wives were the ones that spotted us going over the edge, uh, not being playful, not being healthy, not being good citizens. And their voice was the voice that turned us basically to stop what we were doing. And we're both very grateful for that that presence of that woman's voice in our lives. I don't know what that says, but I, you must hear this. Your voice is, is heard by your mates and your friends and your comrades. Yes? Um, I was just wondering that, I assume like, you knew throughout the week, a week and a half, like what your intentions were to some extent. But um, I was just wondering, was there any point where you kind of got lost in it or you felt that you were also part of the experiment and it was kind of out of your hands and you started to believe, well, maybe this is real or anything like that? Right, in the film, that episode where the, the student follows me into the faculty room and the teacher there addresses the student and says, what are you doing here? Students don't belong in here. And the student replied, I'm a bodyguard. Boy, I, I knew that I had crossed that same line that that student had crossed. We were just into it as opposed to, it wasn't no longer a game or a simulation or an academic exercise. It was something else. We were enjoying that. We were enjoying that internal sense of power, being or acting. All those things were pleasing to us and to me personally. But, but again, it's my wife that caught it and said, you know, you, what, what happened to that playful person I knew? Where are you going? We ask me in the back. Uh, with the great emphasis on individualism that we have nowadays, do you think it's still possible for this to happen? The question is, do I think this might happen today? Of course. I think we're all subject to this possibility. Maybe what is occupied about is it's challenging some of our thinking about what is fair and just and economic and how do we create sets, you know, safety nets and it's a challenge of, of a very, very, very vile system. Well, I think the sense of individualism is, and this is what Philip Zimbardo is working on, he's working on everyday heroes, trying to find and describe where in our culture do we find people taking responsibility for the health of their, themselves and their community. And for me, it means taking care of someone that might live up the street, or, uh, or a garden that needs tending, or a grandchild that needs helping. I mean, there's a lot of evidence of individuals making social commitments that are valuable. Does that help? The question is whether other teachers respond to this or react to this. And the oddity of that is that we kind of teach in our own little cubicles, and I don't know if that's happening in this university, but it's, it's likely that in my case, the English teacher didn't know what the social studies teacher was doing, they didn't know what the PE teacher. We never met as a community. 
There was no forum. There was no place for us to practice democracy in this school setting. If there had been, we might have, as a society, not as individuals, brought that up to the surface and said, what's going on in that class? We have to stop it. Follow up. Follow up. Oh, I suspect that your teachers might not know what's going on in your individual classes. I, I could be wrong there, though. That might be. I'm saying it's so much, it, it was so far outside your class. There were, it seems like there was propaganda all over the place. It's like sometimes you walk around with blinders, and we don't want to know what's going on next door because we have no impact on going on. We have no forum in our place to discuss that. It might have been going on silently, but that's also the story of this, oh, this third way, silence. Students, for the most part, stayed silent. Parents, silent. The local rabbi, silent. Silence. Silence. I mean, to me, the other teacher is not noticing it's scarier than the student's acting. Oh. Oh. Not only did that scary that the teachers didn't know what was going on, but it took 40 years for the students to talk about this. Just like in Germany, you know, they held this kind of grief inside or this pain and never discussed. It didn't happen here. No. 40 years is a long time for these students bravely now to speak about what they felt. Yes? Uh, did you find uh, that one gender was more uh, hesitant to participate or not? Great question. Did I find one gender more susceptible or more willing to? Yes, I think the only protest came out of the women. I would also like to just to give you an insight into one place in Germany that you don't know anything about. I was invited to go to Nuremberg by, by Germans, German librarians. And I'm driving down Nuremberg's main corridor, and I realize I'm on the same street that Hitler went into Nuremberg, and I can see these red, red bananas and all these thoughts flood into my head. And then I'm taken to this building in Nuremberg, and I can see it in the distance. It looks like a cement coffin. And then I realize it's the location where Hitler did the huge rallies. The building once had spotlights that you know, lifted into the sky and columns. And, and that's where those huge grades took place. Now I'm telling you something you have never heard before. How many of you know about the Gold Room? Hmm. Inside the bowels of this building that is prominent in history of the Holocaust is a golden cathedral-like structure, a rectangular gallery building with marble walls, marble floors, and the ceilings are lit in its gold-plated Nazi insignia. A cherished place. This is the location where he did the proclamation of a thousand years of history. At the very end of that gallery is a small room. And I went there, and the, and the door was propped open like a screen coming out. And I walk inside this, and there were about 300 students sitting like you're sitting now, but they were crunched into this dark, dank dungeon of a room. His private chambers. I mean, the walls are like stigmata. And there's a single light bulb that was like a neon you know, sphere. And in this building, there are collections of books from the 1930s. 1930s. And in these books, the Jew is perceived and displayed as a pig. This is the literature that German youth were reading in the 30s. So think about the value of your textbooks, the truth of your textbooks, the truth of history, and remember the gold room. It's there. And there was a history of why we got into that situation. Um, do you think that, that the influence of the third wave is more useful to teach us about the sources of the Holocaust or the sources of fascism? For the Germans, the third wave is really important because kind of popular reading because it says it can happen in any place, but like in Palo Alto. For you, for me personally, it's valuable because it teaches that I I can be a victim of horror, or I can be a, a champion of you know some healthy behavior. I can make those 
We all have choices, we make them every day. We just did a musical of the ways, and one of the songs in the musical is that there's a moment, a moment in time, that comes to everyone, this moment in time. It's not expected, but something is wrong. Injustice right in front of you, what will you do this moment that is here today? Will you pray it away? Will you speak out loud this moment? Truth. So every moment we face the chance to be champions for freedom, think of that. Think of that. For justice. It can happen within your own classroom or community. It doesn't have to be a huge big deal. It just has to happen. Yes? So how do you feel personally when um, people would use your experiment as a defense for Nazism? Well, even scarier than that, I get a lot of phone calls from like reality shows in London and in Spain say, gee, we'd like to do the wave as a reality show. Would you like to come over here and you know, put some students through this to see what happens? I think, like, are you absolutely crazy? <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question. But <laughs> <laughs> Way in the back, maybe? Um, I teach U.S. history, kind of graders in the Well, I'm no longer in the classroom, uh, but that doesn't mean I can't teach. For instance, my, I coached Special Olympic basketball for 30 years, and instead of playing other, quote, Special Olympic basketball teams, mentally and physically disabled, we began to challenge the local fire department, police department, Chinese consulate, you know, the Hells Angels. And, and these Hells Angels are the cockettes that come into our, into our gym and they say, we're playing basketball. And they look over and my players are kind of like <laughs> you know, kind of falling down. And within a matter of minutes, though, that we've created a game where we have to make up the rules to make the game work. It's like, and they want to always come back and play us because of the, that pure joy of freedom. So I think you can teach in any place you might find yourself. Um, if you want to teach about freedom, it's the idea of including people as, a, as opposed to excluding. You know, how do you find ways to, to include does that help? Thank you. Thanks, good. Two more questions. <laughs> what I found interesting in the video is that many of your students said that they went along with the experiment initially because they wanted a good grade. And they kept going and going because this fear of, of, of failure. And it essentially evolved into uh, an idea of personal survival. Can you take that and apply that to Germany, to perpetrators or bystanders? Of, of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust for those people who didn't step up and raise their voices and say we should stop this because it was an issue of they had to look out for themselves and it you know, turned into an issue of... Okay, I'll put that in. I don't know if this is appropriate for your school. I'll put, I'll put that in a sexual prism as opposed to an economic observation. Sexually, you have someone who wants to be very dominant and they think they have destiny on their side and everything they do is just right and they can oppress or they can hurt because they're the chosen one to do so. And then you have the victim. And the victim thinks of themselves as somewhat involved in fate. I'm not destined to be something, but there's fate that's driving me and maybe I'll just, everything will just be okay, I'll just hang in there and someday I might be the one in charge, but I'm just gonna hang back. That's my fate. And then there's most of us, witnesses. So there's oppression going on, but we sit there as witnesses and say, well, they must deserve it. They must deserve it. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to watch. Everything will be okay. I think most of us are witnesses to oppression. We just don't know how to fight it. We don't know when to fight it. And my argument is you probably fight it every day of your life in some way. Yes? What drew you teaching mental disability, people with mental disability back to the way it's third grade? Well, working with mental disability, the whole idea is to empower oneself, to make oneself feel really good, and find yourself within the community, not excluded from the community. So we did a lot of plays, dramas. We went out into the community. Instead of staying hidden, 
like we were the lepers, we would take our theater company to bookstores or into poetry shops or to coffee houses, and we would perform our stories, telling our stories. And that, that way people got to know us and wouldn't be afraid of us. And a lot can be gained by that. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, the buses will be leaving at 1045. We're going to go to